morning and welcome to Safari Live on this slightly cloudy morning. It is actually quite warm, 26 degrees Celsius, I mean sorry, 21 degrees Celsius, 69 Fahrenheit. My name is Brent Smith. I have Andrew Joseph Francis on camera with me and we're in, suit, in search of the elusive leopard. So for those of you not sure, last night we extended a little bit uh, and we Jamie and Steph managed to find Karula. She looked really fat. She'd just gone for a drink, and we're all pretty convinced she's got a kill somewhere in this thick bush that we're sitting in at the moment. And uh, we've come here first thing in the morning to see if we can find her. So we're just listening for a little bit, see if we can hear any crunching of bones. Hopefully, if she does have a kill, it's not all gone already. Uh, but it is going to be an exciting sunrise safari. Jamie uh, and Tebs are out in the other vehicle. Scott's out tracking. And we have uh, Kirsten and Nicola in a final control. So we're just going to listen quietly for a second. And it's that wonderful still just before the bush really wakes up in the morning. Thing yet, but what we are looking for here is as we move through, we're looking for any prominent trees uh, where she might be able to hoist uh, a kill. What we're going to do is I'm going to move back out of here, get back onto that elephant path, and uh, go around the block. It is possibly the thickest area on Juma, and the elephants have broken a lot of trees, so it makes it a very diff difficult area to off road. But I'm hoping and as soon as first light comes, uh, I might take a stroll into the drainage line on her tracks where we last had them last night. Uh, if we don't get any success uh, from the vehicle, uh, I'm not going to be silly. I'm going to wait till I can see what I'm doing before I go meandering around the bushes. Can you hear a little rattling cesticular making noise over there? And there's a proper little LBJ for the birders out there. Quite often, a lot of the cesticulars you can only identify from their call. And for the new viewers here, I'm not twitchers. And I'll explain that. Twitcher is a very avid bird watcher, and an LBJ means a little brown job. So very small, uh, dull, in, in this indistinct birds uh, and as I said often you can only identify them by their call. Uh, rattling cesticular is the most common LBJ we get and we do hear this call very often. Uh, one of my old trackers described it as uh, the rattling cesticular says kiss kiss run away kiss kiss run away. Uh, that one is a calling for the joy of life not because it's spotted a leopard unfortunately. system, a very thick drainage system. So while we do that, let's go say good morning to Jamie. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Oh, we're on the bumpiest part of every, oh, any road in Juma. Up we go, there we go. So, thank you to Chris Rogue, who sent us through an update about the lapping sounds or the drinking sounds that she heard at the Juma Dam sometime in the middle of last night, around about three in the morning. And Chris, I've come across to just double check and see if there's any tracks that might give us a hint as to what that animal was, because unfortunately it appears as though the camera didn't quite manage to find it. I'm just having a look now. And so far, what I've seen the most of, I haven't picked up on any leopard or lion tracks, lots and lots of hyena tracks. Makes me wonder whether they didn't come wandering through, especially with that salty hippo that they've been feeding on in Torchwood. I'm fairly certain it's our clan that's feeding there. I'm gonna use 
with my spotlight to help me out. Lots and lots of hyena tracks. I suspect that that's maybe what was drinking last night. But you never know, and because it's a little bit dark still, um, I could well have missed something. We are, of course, all waiting with eager anticipation to see which lion pride is going to come back to visit us first, or which group of lions is going to visit us first. Now, I know that Brent is on his way to look for the Queen of Juma after that brief sighting that you had of her yesterday. And I just wanted to share one thing from my side that I learned from that particular sighting. Just before you all arrived with Brent, when we spotted her, Steph and myself were out, and Tibbs as well, by the way, who's on the back of our vehicle as our cameraman. And we were sitting at, um, at the dam close to Buffles Hook. And she crossed out straight into the road in front of us. But what was actually the most fascinating about that particular sighting was we all looked up because we heard a monkey alarm call. But the monkey alarm call was just once. Rusty, don't do this to me. Rusty is having a moment where reverse doesn't seem to want to happen. This is truck going forward a bit first. But yes, now usually monkeys, when they see leopards, they go into full-on alarm call mode, they bark, that sound that I tried to imitate and sound like Donald Duck, but you roughly get the idea. And he only called once, that monkey was, it was one, and that was it. And it just goes to show that you really can't ignore any kind of sign like that in the bush. I never, I never would have guessed that that was the case. And I don't know whether it was because maybe she was lying up at the dam the whole time and the monkeys were actually tired of alarm calling at her and had gone quiet and then when she moved it was more just a notification to the rest of the monkeys because they all knew she was there. So it was just a quick, hey look, the leopard's on the move. But it really was quite an interesting experience and quite an interesting learning experience. You can't ignore anything out here. You never know what it might lead you to. So far though, the updates on the lapping, only hyena tracks. Well, this is wonderful to hear. We have a new viewer, so new lady, welcome to the Sunrise Safari. I'm sure you will become as addicted as the rest of us are to these wonderful live moments. And just to let you know that it says live, so you just never know what to expect. For example, yesterday we were sitting at the hyena den talking about spotted hyena interaction with other predators. And as we were in the middle of chatting about that, three wild dogs came racing through and changed the entire pace of the morning completely. It just goes to show. There are surprises around every corner. And that's why, although I haven't picked up on any tracks around the pan, I wouldn't be surprised if we could possibly follow up on something like a leopard or a lion. So, Mew Lady, welcome. I'm sure you will be intrigued. There are times when you will laugh and cry, but there is no better way to get to know the individual animals of the Sabi Sands and by joining us twice a day, every day. <coughs> right at that twilight hour in between night and day. that we can actually take you on a safari whilst you are sitting anywhere and Neva says she's currently on a safari in her office. I know that lots of people watch us to keep them entertained during those long office hours. It's just hyena tracks. Let me just double check. Yeah. Definitely hyena tracks. So they've been up and down the road all night. I will, I will show you a nice hyena track when it gets a little bit lighter and the light's easier to show you. 
It's also interesting to think about the sounds of an animal lapping. It's interesting that Chris picked up on the fact that it was probably a predator, and they do drink very differently. Now, in my experience, just as a, an interesting observation, with, and you can see it in your pet cats as well as your pet dogs, but it applies to the larger cat species as well. But quite often, leopards, are more, leopards and lions are more quiet in terms of drinking, the way that they curl their tongue backwards when they start to lap and they use the water tension to pull the water into their mouths versus the way that dogs drink, which is to lap in a much messier, much noisier way. Now, I'm, my experience with hyenas has taught me that they have a very similar approach to dogs. Of course, they're not dogs. They're actually closely related to the cat family, but they sit in a family all of their own. But I imagine that they lap in a much faster way. Evolu and evolutionary biologists have suggested that that's because with the cats, they tend to move in a less haphazard and generally more solitary way, or slightly, in the case of the lions, a slower way. So a leopard is solitary, doesn't need to rush its drinking, can drink for a bit and then move off. If it has to, if it's threatened, and then come back. Whereas with pack animals, they tend to move around in a much speedier fashion. Good morning, Warburgs. Interesting that our pale Warburg eagles, one of the most exquisite birds out here. But unfortunately, I don't think that their nest that we've been watching over the last few weeks, I don't think it's been successful. There's no sign of any chicks or any eggs. But look at that. They are such stunning birds. Puffed up, it's a little bit chilly this morning, not nearly as bad as yesterday. You can see how ruffled the feathers are. For new viewers, this is a pale morph. Oh. Warburg's eagle with something stuck in its throat, apparently. I think something uncomfortable in its crop, maybe. But yes, maybe for Mew Lady and any others that have joined us for the first time, what we always encourage you to do is start to keep a list of all of the birds that you can see on safari. I know that Brent touched on a lot of the different species this morning, and maybe some of the smaller species. But this pale Warburg's eagle is... It's only really about five or ten percent of Warburgs that actually take on this pale colouring. The rest of them are a more tawny coloured brown. There's a mated pair that returns here every single year. They are migratory birds. And if you're looking to identify them when you go on your next safari, or maybe you just have a look at the bird that you see on television, look at the little crest. I'm going to stand on one leg, pretend to be a one-legged bird. Look at the little crest on the top of the head and look at the very short, square nature of the tail. And that's quite a good way of identifying Warburgs. They're true eagles, which means they've got feathers all the way down to their feet. And with this wonderful camera, it means that we can actually see that quite clearly. So feathers tucked all the way down to their toes, but quite a small little eagle species. So just a little bit bigger than a goshawk or, an, or close to the size of an African hawk eagle. And then the dark eye and the half yellow, half black bull. I wonder what's up with the Swalbergs. What have you been eating? Of course, swallowing little rodents and amphibians whole means that you could wind up with a couple of bones uncomfortably lodged in places. So I always find the anatomy of birds incredible. You can see the way that it's fluffed up, that down level, down layer of feathers to help to insulate it. I wonder where its mate is. We usually see the pair of them. They're both pale morph, pale morph Warburgs. And as I said, they migrate here every year, apparently this particular pair, they return to the same nesting site. Their nesting site is about 100 meters behind where I've just come through. And no sign of any chicks or eggs in that nest. And of course, dead trees like this make for a perfect and beautiful silhouette. There's a reason why we see raptors sitting on the edge of them. And that's because 
they can take off unencumbered by any kind of foliage. It makes for a good vantage point. They can survey the land using those incredible binocular eyes, but without running any risk of being tangled in leaves or thorns. I know that Brent is desperate to go out tracking on foot, but let's pop over to him quickly so that he can update you on his progress. So we've checked the majority of the way around this. Oh, I thought I saw something in the tree block. We're just very carefully checking uh, the main access road now. Make sure she hasn't crossed or uh, if she does have a kill, it's not to the western side of the road. So join me as we just check around a little bit. Uh, if, we get, if we don't get anything, it's light enough now that I can go have a stroll uh, and try to find her on foot. There's a lot of prominent elephant parts here that she might have used. So, <laughs> Clown uh, Sharon says I should put the man bun on to transform into the safari samurai to aid in my in my my task of finding Karula. You can see there's a lot of prominent elephant paths that lead between two water holes here. So if she was going to walk through here, she's probably going to walk down one of these paths. We're just checking them very carefully. Uh, what makes it quite difficult is there were lots of elephant in this area last night uh, and they might have obliterated tracks. So far, so good. Well, stay with me. We're just going to do one little loop around back to where we saw him last night. Now that it's a bit lighter, you never know, we might spot something in the tree from a distance. Another big elephant path. there so let's make our way around back to where we last had her so fingers crossed it has been a bit dark uh, there's a possibility I've missed tracks but I'm pretty confident I didn't so fingers crossed she's in this block it's quite a small block uh, probably 10 hectares so 20 22 acres somewhere around there so I should be able to cover it on foot relatively quickly and which will hopefully a leopard for us. So, a good morning and a warm safari live welcome to Zoe. Uh, Zoe likes to know, do leopards ever catch monkeys? Most definitely, Zay. Um, I think Jamie had uh, Karula with a vervet monkey kill, or James, possibly. I can't remember. I think I was on leave when it happened. Um, it could have been Scott, but what, any of the other three, just not me. It was Scott. There we go. Uh, and uh, they do. And leopards, like most predators, are opportunists. But you know what? Just have a quick look down at the water. Maybe she went for a drink. So, let me take you through my reasoning why I think she's got a kill here. Yeah. So, she was very fat bellied uh, when we saw her at the end of the safari last night. And uh, she came directly from Sydney's Warthog. So quite often when leopards do have kills, uh, they will leave the kill to go have a drink. And across our western boundary, let's just have a look at we can see through there. Um, across our western boundary, there's a pan very close. So I think if she'd be on the western side of the road, she would have gone to drink there rather than 
here and almost smells like there's a faint smell of meat in the air when we're around that drainage system. And there we can see uh, there's nothing at the water hole. There we go. So let's go back. cover is getting a bit thicker so it's quite warm this morning and that's because the clouds were there overnight and quite strangely a lot of people assume that when it's cloudy it's going to be cold but quite often if you had a warm day like we did yesterday and then the cloud cover comes in overnight it acts as sort of an insulative blanket so the, the warm air can't actually dissip dissipate up into the cool night sky so it holds the, the warmth in Here we have a very prominent elephant path, and Joel in New York is wondering why these are called elephant paths. Well, Joel, because the majority of the time they're maintained and made by elephants who walk these routes between water and feeding points regularly. And you can see there's quite a few of them around here and they crisscross each other. But we're getting to the spot where we had Karula last night. And you can you smell any meat? Negative. So this is where she walked off uh, from right here. We were parked just like this, and she actually walked right in front of the vehicle into this little dry creek bed. So I'm pretty sure I'm confident I'm going to be able to find tracks on this nice soft sand. So uh, while I go for a stroll, let's go back across to Jamie. Uh, see what she's up to, and hopefully when we come back, we might have located the Queen of Jua. Whilst Brent goes wandering, we have made our way across to the... Whoop, oh, bumpy. Across to the Wawati drainage line, which is always a good place to come and follow up on any kind of animals. Now, I know that Brent's been chatting a lot to you guys about seep lines and underground places where the water flows a bit closer to the surface and allows for vegetation to be a, carry a bit more in the way of nutrients and just be a little bit greener. Um, the drainage lines have a very similar effect. So obviously a drainage line is essentially the cumulative effect of all of that draining at a point where the water can flow down and through a channel. Coming along places like this, you can actually see how much greener the vegetation is. And the animals know all about it. It's also denser. For, so for animals like kudu, and in Yala, it's a good hiding place. And actually, speaking of good hiding places, I'll leave it for Scott to tell the full story. But we were, Brent and myself, heard Nikki and Scott having a good giggle last night, and were met with a, they were met with a bushbuck in their shower. But I will leave Scott to tell you that full story on the sunset safari this afternoon. Very entertaining, but shame. Poor little animal was looking for are probably looking for some water and a nice sheltered spot to spend the night. I don't think they appreciate it though in their shower. They have an outside shower by the way, which is how it got in. <laughs> We've had close encounters with Nyala, Bushbuck. Now, I'm laughing about it and I'm sure Scott will touch on this when he chats to you this afternoon. Bushback are actually quite, um, they can be quite dangerous little animals, especially this one in particular was a male. And we've, you know, we've told a couple of jokes about Brent and his and Yana experience as well. It's important to remember that these animals, even something as small as a bushback, just fairly tiny for those of you who are new viewers, one of the smallest species of the antelope that we see out here, they're still incredibly powerful much, much stronger per pound than we are. And also in fear can be even stronger. The strengthening effects of adrenaline 
is not a force to be trifled with. It's the same reason why when we're out walking, and I'm sure Brent will be doing this as we speak, we walk around things like burrows to avoid warthogs dashing out. And it's not unheard of for bushbuck to have maimed or killed people in the past. Hey, there's our virtual call. He's not going to sit down, though. I have a constant battle with this virtual skookle on this road. It lives on Vulture's Nest, and I'm always trying to get it on camera, and it always disappears off into the vegetation as I come through. I can see you. I can see you. There we go. A bird that looks almost like a raptor species. This is probably the best view we're going to get hidden behind the vegetation. And you can be certain that it always disappears as we try to have a look at it. But chatting about bird species, Brian, you've asked how many different species of eagle that we get out here. So I'm going to utilize my book at the same time. But let's start thinking about it. So in the Sabi Sands itself, fish eagle, there's a tawny eagle, there's lesser spotted, there's steppe eagle, Warburg's eagle. I know I'm forgetting a whole load of them. Fish eagle is not quite a true eagle, obviously, because it doesn't have feathers all the way down to its feet. Let's go through, just a, a quick summary. So we'll definitely get a lesser spotted eagle around here. Uh, it's very similar in shape and size to a steppe and a tawny. Very easy to confuse them. Here's a tawny, this is a, oh sorry, this is a step eagle here, and then a tawny eagle below it. You can see how very, very similar they are in terms of shape and color. And we've got the Wahlbergs right at the bottom, that little Wahlbergs we were looking at, so what's that? That's five already. Booted eagle on the list, although I haven't managed to see one or get one on camera. Hawk eagles don't count. Oh no, they do actually, sorry. Hawk eagles, so we're on six, seven. Could get an airs hawk eagle. I haven't managed to here, but we could get one. That's eight. Long crested is nine. <laughs> lots and lots of different birds. Could get a crowned eagle if we were really lucky. Again, not one I've managed to get on camera. And the biggest of them all, the martial eagle. Absolutely huge wingspan, enormous and close to a meter in height, so close to three feet in height. A bird that's capable of taking down even the antelope species. I lost track. How many was that? I think it was close to, at least close to 10. So Brian, those are the main species. That was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but we're always trying to add new ones to your list. who's watching in Dallas. So Tom is comparing our sort of different range of species to those in his hometown of Dallas, Texas. You're he saying he's comparing the two of them and in in his particular, in Tom's particular area, there are only two species of eagle but lots of hawks. Whilst out here, we have lots of species of eagles and less hawks. And it's a good point. I mean, we've got lots and lots of smaller birds of prey that are similar to or hawk-like in their hunting style and in their appearance. And I'm thinking, of course, of the goshawks, named, of course, after hunting geese, as far as I know, being used to hunt geese. But goshawks and things like lizard buzzards, honey buzzards, lizard, yeah, I've said lizard buzzards, um, shikras, African goshawks, all of those little species that we do get to see. And I think it's, it is fascinating to see the way that the animals have evolved to occupy very similar niches, but just so subtly different. It's also fascinating how adaptable the animals are. So it's very common, even though they are fierce hunters in their own right, to see something like a batelier or a tawny eagle actually foraging on the prey that or on carcasses that have been brought down. And I know that's one of the things that Brent will be looking for while he's 
trying to see if he could find Karuna's kill is the fact that... Sorry... Is the... is looking for signs of birds of prey. Hyenas. Uh, Zoe? You were... Sorry, I'm just double checking because this is one of the big pathways towards the Juma Dam to see whether we could identify the mystery lapper that wandered through in the middle of last night. But Zoe, you were wondering whether we ever see the birds of prey catch something like a squirrel. I haven't seen them catch a squirrel yet, but I have seen squirrel frantically alarm calling at the presence of a bird of prey. I'm yet to see them catch a squirrel, but we have had some incredible sightings with them. The one that comes to mind for me, they've been up and down here all night. This is also, by the way, the road, it's a direct link between where the dead hippo is on Torchwood and their den. So they've been moving up and down here all night. The hyenas, that is. Sorry, Zoe, the one sighting that comes to mind for me was a goshawk that had killed a Franklin, which is also something that always amazes me because the, the disparity in size between that tiny little African goshawk and the Franklin itself, which is quite a big bulky bird. It's impressive to see that they are capable of hunting such prey. It does happen, we do get live kills. The nice, the nice woodlands kingfisher in front of me since we are discussing all of the beautiful bird species that we get out here with this incredible camera. You get to see all kinds of things that we might not usually get to see, including the heat wave coming off Rusty's engine. Now, watch the way that this bird is looking around it. So although it's called a kingfisher, Woodlands kingfisher, in fact, most of our species of kingfisher out here are not, in fact, fishers. And they mostly prey on things like crickets and insects. And that's what this Woodlands is doing now cocking its head from side to side. Obviously, it's got a blind spot. The way that its eyes are positioned, it's got a blind spot directly in front of its beak. And so it has to turn its head from side to side in order to spot prey. But vision that is far better than a human's and also has a further spectrum of light to it. So they can see, some of them can see ultraviolet spectrums. And that's a great way of assisting in their hunting. And while we sit here, just listen to that ghostly whistle. That's a gray-headed bush shrike hiding somewhere in the vegetation. Are you gonna catch something, Kingfisher? They are such stunning birds and very, very easily identifiable with that bright blue and black, and then the red on the top half of the bill and the black on the bottom. There's a pair of them that lives in the house with us. thing about this particular camera is that we get the most extraordinary views if the bird decides to sit still long enough long enough for us to look at them and one incredible sighting we had was with a tiny little pearl spotted owlet and Ben Phillips I know you were wondering if there are any owl species in South Africa and for some reason the word owl in a South African accent is a real struggle for a lot of people so I'm talking about O-W-L owl and yes, Ben, we've got lots and lots of different ones. One of them, or a couple of them actually, are the size of this tiny little kingfisher. And we get some really small ones. So things like the Scops owl, the pearl spotted owlet, or the African barred owlet as well. And we always have a look around for those. And then the common species, or the larger species that you might see out here, would be a, oh, bye bye. Done being on camera would be something like a 
less a spotted owl, eagle owl, or a rose eagle owl. And rose are incredibly big, powerful birds, beautiful birds. I know Scott managed to get one on camera. There's a pair of them that used to live around the dam. We used to hear them fairly regularly. I think they've started moving a little bit in terms of their territory. They are territorial birds, but they do have enormous territories. I'm talking about two miles worth of riverine vegetation. So yes, you could well see an owl. We're always on the lookout for the little owl species as well, especially first thing in the reducing competition with the larger species of the nocturnal owls. The little owls have evolved to become crepuscular. So they come out in the morning and just at that little in-between time to avoid competition with the We just went through a bit of a signal patch and of course it's one of those inevitabilities of, of live safaris is that sometimes you do just get gremlins attacking your technology that's to my best understanding of it we go through bad signal patches that just our oh, signal dips yesterday when we drove along this road um, Steph spotted a fresh excavation site by an art farm and we wanted to see whether there's any sign of it returning home for the night. It's tucked in the drainage line. It'll be tricky for us to get to, but we might be able to have a look and just see. I still haven't managed to see an art farm, although it's the wrong, not really the right time of year. We need it to be a little bit cooler and they start to come out earlier in the evening. What have you seen? What's wrong? Very alert little Linyalas. Uh, Mom's relaxed. They were all looking off directly into the drainage line. But I think that was just being cautious. They might have heard a sound there because they've relaxed and they're making their way in. The little one. Wandering through at the back. I think I even see the beginning of horns there. Look how spotty that one is as well. Got lots of little white dots. I wonder if this is our joker. For those of you who have missed some of the Inyala sightings we've had over the last few days, there's been a group of Inyala that has really enjoyed the cooler weather and they've actually been playing with one of them running round and round in circles and it's such fun to watch. It's nice to see animals actually having fun. Let's watch the way that they approach the thick vegetation. And I actually want to show you something before it walks straight. Oh, okay, it's going to... A little one. <laughs> this is the group. I just want to show you something walking across the road in front of us. The tallest land mammal, and I had no idea that it was there. A big female. Sure. Let's try and catch up with her. Just to, to let you know, she was standing right behind where the Inyala were. It's amazing how an animal that big can disappear in the way that they do. Where did you go, big girl? She's on a mission, though. Walking fast. It's OK, Gertie. going to play hard to get with us. It's a very large female giraffe. It's one of the biggest I've seen on Juma. And how to tell it's a female? 
Well, that's the best way. Quite obvious in giraffe. But I noticed on the top of her head as well, those ossicones, which are currently hidden behind the branch, are tufted. Look how dark she is as well. It's a very mature female. It's not often that you get to see them this dark in colour. And there you can see the ox picker underneath her tail targeting all of those ticks. You can imagine what a relief that is for her. Look at that, that must be so itchy. So to have a helpful bird friend, oh that's, sorry, takes me right back to the ox picker there. It's a juvenile. The one on top has got a black beak, you see that? Oh, it doesn't look like our typical ox picker friend at the bottom and that's because it's a juvenile ox picker. The dark beak. Combing through her fur. Oh, there's another one. Two juveniles. Cool. I'm doing this giraffe female a huge favor in terms of ridding her of those itchy parasites. I always find it fascinating to watch their technique as well. For those of you collecting your bird list or checking off your bird list, these are red-billed ox pickers. Even the ones with the dark-colored beaks. There we go, that's the adult ox picker. We get two species, we get the yellow-billed and the red-billed. It's much more common to see the red-billed with their wonderful yellow ring around the eye. And what's nice is we can actually see, watch the way they work with their tails. You see how those tails bend forward like that? So the tails of ox pickers are unusually enforced or reinforced. So they're very, very stiff. And that gives them an extra support system because as you can imagine, holding on at such odd angles is sometimes very tricky. Oh, the tail's not the best place to, yeah. Swung it away. But yes, their tail feathers are reinforced to help to balance them on the animals. Thank you, girl. You think a little bit camera shy, moving off into dense vegetation. We'll leave her be for the morning. But a nice brief look at the fairly mutually beneficial relationship between ox pickers and the mammal species out here. This is definitely the group in the art of it, we know. This is nice because now we get to actually really see the difference between the females that we saw earlier and these teenage boys that are starting to get that dark color of the males and the fluffy beards down the front of their neck and around, along the top of their backs. They're still young. Their horns are only just starting to grow, but there's a nice comparison in terms of color. So for the Inyana species, the, they have one of the greatest sexual dimorphisms of any of the antelope species. In other words, the males are very different from the females. You can see that real difference in color. Beautiful antelope either way, and now there's a nice big male that's coming up behind them, so you can see what the males look like when they are fully grown. And this is a big Nyala bull. Ivory tips on his horns, not actual ivory, but they're called ivory, the pale tips. And that beautiful thick, dark, coat and fur and he uses that image of himself puffs himself up to make himself look bigger as a way of scaring off rival males that's a nice way to look and that's for new viewers who hear us referring to bulls and cows i refer to the giraffe female as a cow i refer to that male nyala as a bull that's actually where the division happens because nyala are so different the males and the females there's a division that happens in terms of naming so anything that is the size of a female good morning, nyala, well, okay. good morning. you can be turned down for a moment um, the, anything that is the size of an Inyala female or smaller is referred to as a ewe and the males are referred to rams. So when we stop at impalas, we call them rams and we call them ewes. But anything that is the size of an Inyala bull or bigger is referred to as a bull and a cow. So it's just one of those interesting little aspects. That's where the division happens. always 
looking off. I'm always looking for them. The Salapa, we've stopped at the beautiful, um, the beautiful Inyala, but there's one other antelope species that we've been following very regularly, or trying to at least, I've been trying to, and that is the pregnant kudu, which is part of the same family, but bigger than the Inyala. And there's been a couple of enormously rotund kudu cows. And Lissalapa, you're wondering if I've paid a visit to her. I saw her after the live show ended, I think two days ago, still pregnant. The, the one that I'm thinking of with the stripe division down her right backside. So the white stripes that run down the side of them. She's got quite an easily identifiable feature. But for new viewers, we came around the corner. I've been trying to follow these pregnant females without stressing them, obviously, but trying to kind of get an update on their progress every morning. And we got so lucky the other day. We arrived just maybe a couple of hours after the birth of one of these kudu calves. And luckily, because we'd spent, I think because we'd spent a fair amount of time with that particular kudu group, the mother was perfectly relaxed in our presence and actually stood in the road and suckled her newborn calf. I'm always on the lookout, but Lissalapa, I haven't seen them in about two days. This is a good place to continue looking. They move in a wider area than that Inyala group does. So that Inyala group is the one that we've seen regularly around Nyala Road South, funnily, funnily enough, this particular road, and around the Central Road Junction. They love that area. But the Kudu actually, their movements range a little bit further. It has been fascinating though to learn a little bit more because I've been paying attention for the first time in my life to specific identities of Nyala and Kudu. I've actually learned a great deal about the way that they move. a bit of a dip in signal here so I'm just gonna go quiet you can enjoy the flashes of scenery until I come up the other side guys miss anything that I was going to say. But we do have a question, since we've been chatting a bit about birds, we have a question from Siberia, Siberia Zumi about our different kingfisher species. And I'm actually going to stop so I can show you. It's much easier so that uh, for you to see pictures. But Siberia Zumi wanted to know what the difference is between the woodlands kingfisher, the brown hooded and the grey hooded. Let me stop for a moment so that I can show you. I wanted to see if those Daker were going to stop running, but I think they've disappeared. There were a couple of them just in the road ahead of us. Ooh. Hello, little boy. He took me by surprise. Yana, Yana everywhere. You've got to look left and right in this place. <laughs> Let's have a look at that little teenage boy while I find a picture to answer Siberia Zumi's question. Okay, so this 
is a, probably the easiest way. We'll start with the grey headed, which is one of the ones that Siberia Zumi asked. Have a look in particular at the chestnut belly without any kind of sort of rufous stripes along the belly. This is the one that's easiest to confuse with the brown headed. So totally red beak, grey head, and that combination of black and yellow on the wings. Now if we go down to the bottom one, which is the brown hooded, that's probably the easiest one to confuse. So you can see it's, it is not that clear. The distinction between the brown and the gray is actually not that clear when you see them in real life, if, especially if you get a quick flash of them wandering through. And maybe one of the best ways to actually tell the difference is there's a bit more sort of rufous coloring to the belly with sort of patchings of dark feathers. Buff is the way that they describe it in this book. That's probably your best way of telling the difference between the gray headed and the brown hooded, which are the ones that are easiest to confuse out here. If we go up and we have a look at the woodlands, there's much more blue for a start. And there's also that distinctive black and then, or black at the bottom and red on the top in their bills. So, and it's also much larger than the gray headed and the brown hooded. There's one other wood, or there's one other kingfisher species that I haven't yet to get on camera, but does, could possibly occur here. And that is this little striped kingfisher. You can see how it could also be possibly confusing, but it's got a black on top and red below and striped breast. And that's one that we always keep an eye out for. I personally haven't managed to get one on camera, but you never know, there's still hope and they definitely occur here. Lots and lots of kingfisher species. We haven't been seeing the fishing species of the pride and the giant kingfisher for a while. There's not much water and there's not much for them to um, catch around here. They're not insect eaters like the rest of the species. And of course then there's that beautiful bright purple with the yellow bill, that bright tiny little pygmy kingfisher. keep a look out and it's almost like a treasure hunt finding all of the different bird species that we find out here and speaking of treasure hunts I wonder how Brent's treasure hunt for the Queen has gone let's pop over there and find out so unfortunately no leopard but there's quite a conundrum happening in that block so I guess there must have been easily a hundred elephants through there last night they could have quite easily chased her. So very difficult to see tracks as well as they've just walked all over. Uh, also, I did find a drag mark. So for those who are not sure, a drag mark, it's a, generally a predator that's been dragging uh, a kill. But this was being dragged by hyenas. So it is possible that if she did have a kill, she didn't manage to hoist it up into a tree. Uh, the hyenas might have stolen it, uh, which would have caused her to move on. And with a huge amount of elephants in the area, so we're going to check Sandy Patch Road quickly, just very slowly now that there's a bit more light checking for tracks. I've rechecked this area and I still don't find any tracks crossing, but there have been a lot of elephants so they might have walked over her tracks. Also, as uh, our regular viewers will know, uh, Kula is very sneaky. Uh, she's probably one of the most difficult methods I've ever tracked because she tends to change her mind a lot. So a very warm safari alive, emphasis on the word live there. Uh, welcome to Max Lawson on YouTube who's wondering, is this really live? Well, Max, uh, since I'm asking your, answering your question, I hope that's proof enough for you. It says, really likes the channel, but wondering how we stream it. Now, Max, that is for greater men than you and I, I feel. Uh, I, uh, we have some tech genius wizards uh, can joke around cap that some of them can read code as it zzzz across the screen. Uh, they're able to uh, beam a signal behind us. They have an antenna, which beams up into a repeater which then beams to our final control, uh, which then beams... Where does it go next, Andrew? Do you know? Somewhere in here. 
in the UK. I thought it went to Dubai. What's that thing? It goes somewhere, then it goes somewhere else. Oh, it goes to London. There we go, it goes to London, and then from London, everywhere else. Uh, water to you. Yes, yes, sir. And then to Utah in the United States. There we go. So uh, I, I could not begin to describe how it gets there. I just know it gets there and that enables you to join us on a live safari twice a day. Stick to the things you know. I know about lions and leopards and elephants and things. Uh, how to make a video stream across the world. Definitely out of my sphere of knowledge. to Eric in Virginia Beach. Just since we're starting the drive, we'd like to know a little bit more about Juma. Uh, he said some of the road names uh, seem to have been named uh, after people. And, uh, and uh, we'd like to know who is Zoe, uh, Philemon, and Gary. Uh, and there's another one, actually, Rebecca as well. Well, Philemon, I'm not sure. I've actually recently been in contact with Yuri and Pippa, who are the owners of Juma. And after our little history discussion, it's sort of got to be in my bonnet. And I've asked them to send me some information about the history of Juma itself, and not so much the general history of the Southern Sands. So as soon as I get that, I will share that with you. Uh, but Zoe and Rebecca are Yuri and Pippa's daughters. That's where that, those roads are named after. And Gauri is actually the name of the farm. So a lot of the farms in this area are named, uh, have English names. And if you go look at the, the sort of original uh, maps or the, the maps that hold the names of the farms, obviously they've all changed. the corner he reared up in the road in front of us and we got to see the black mouth as he hissed look at this one of the most awesome snake species out here there you can see that shape of the head so typical of the black mamba species called black mamba because the inside of their mouth is totally black seeking refuge in the tree most, one of the most venomous and awe-inspiring predators out here. Packs a powerful, powerful neurotoxic venom. And I can see it moving through. This is incredible. You can hear one of the bird species furiously alarm calling. Look at the way it's lifting its body up. When we came around this corner, it lifted two thirds of its body and flared the slight hood that it has. Wow. This is one of my most incredible sights. And look at it, look at it extending its body. That is such strength reaching up into the bush willow. Oh, that is incredible. Look how long it is two meters easily, six feet of pure muscle. What an incredible, incredible moment. Yo, my heart's beating quite fast, actually. <laughs> There's nothing like having a snake rear up at your bonnet in surprise, but all that was, they have this terrible reputation of being aggressive snakes. And yes, to an extent, but the only reason he reared up at us is because he felt threatened. 
You can see the smooth scale, that olive color, and the black dots on his belly. He's starting to calm down. Oh, I hope Cheesy Cheetah is watching. Look at that. Coiled, ready to spring. Oh, what a beautiful animal. And Ariel, yes, they are. Um, they're not poisonous. Poisonous is when something is eaten and has a toxic effect. They are venomous, which means they inject or bite poison. They've got powerful front-facing fangs. And you're looking at one of the most venomous snakes that we have in South Africa. One of the top six most deadly species. But, that being said, one that is incredibly beautiful. So the venom is neurotoxic. It attacks the nervous system of the species that it, and its prey species. Wow, look at the way it's bobbing, using that flickering sensory tongue to guide its movements. They are breathtakingly beautiful. So essentially within South Africa itself, we have a couple of really deadly snake species. This is one of the top deadly ones and it can kill a grown man in the space of about 20 minutes after the bite unless a person is given urgent medical attention. That being said, you don't understand how rare bites actually are. 90% or somewhere around that statistic, about 90% of snake bites that happen, happen with people either trying to play with or catch and remove these deadly creatures and you should never ever try and catch a snake unless you know exactly what you're doing and they've got this awesome and terrifying reputation which you can understand but it comes from people interfering with them and now you can see how relaxed the snake is in our presence and Kevin you want to know how close we are we're far enough away that I feel comfortable it does happen that you occasionally surprise them in the road. Tibbs is going to just give you a rough idea since he's not going to disappear just yet. Um, and if we zoom out, you can see we're probably about, what would that be, about five meters away from the start of the car. So we're sitting here. He's sitting comfortably in a tree there. And I've given him plenty of space to feel comfortable. We didn't when we first came around the corner. That's the thing about live safaris, as we always say. There's, there's that tip of the tail. So he reared up in fright and gave us quite an aggressive response, but that was just fear. Look at that incredible head shape. Oh, so exciting. This is the best black mamba sighting I think I've ever had. And Vanessa, I'm not sure. I actually think that he came out to bask in the morning light. You want to, Vanessa wants to know if he was after something. Could be, it could well be that we interrupted some kind of hunt, but I think generally when a snake is stretched across the middle of the road as he was, it's because they're looking for warmth. So as ectotherms, they're reliant on the external temperature to moderate their body temperature. Look at that power. It doesn't look like he's eaten recently. There's no strange bulges that would indicate a recent meal. Now that snake is longer than I am tall. In fact, I'm fairly certain it's longer than Brent is tall. And pure muscle. Look at the way it guides its head forward, holding up its body weight. You can see the slight hood. No. <laughs> Gerard, you are absolutely right. Not a snake we want to find in our kitchen. I know that many of you have been updated as to the saga of the spitting cobra that was spotted on the microwave of our camp. They are lightning fast, as are all snakes. Their speed is not to be underestimated. Their reflexes are not to be underestimated. That being said, 
as I mentioned, it's purely a fear response that causes them to lash out at people. And it's actually incredibly unusual for a person to be bitten. It does happen. It is one of those aspects of life out in the bush. And I'm sure if there are any viewers in Australia, you're also very familiar with the more deadly type of snakes that occasionally... Oh, he's got an injury there. What is that? There's some kind of puncture wound there on his side. You can see the smoothness of the scales. I love snakes. I think they're extraordinary creatures. Absolutely, Janet. What? <laughs> Janet, who's watching in Canada, Janet's going to be paying us a visit soon, coming across to Voyatella, which is the lodge on Juma where we operate. And Janet, you're wondering who's going to make sure that there, he isn't a companion in your room. It definitely is, by the way, Janet, the best mamba sighting I've ever had in my life, actually. So I'm glad that you're enjoying it. And don't worry, there are plenty of staff members that double-check the rooms beforehand. There are screens all across to keep them out. And again, very, very unusual to find them in human habitation. They're actually terrified of people. I mean, this, this is unusual, to see a black mamba of this size. And there you go, Wicked Blue Band. You wanted to know how rare this is. Well, this is the first time I've ever had a black mamba sighting like this. Usually they are over in a split second as the snake dashes into the hole or a termite mound or a log or something. And obviously you don't go trying to play with black mambas to try and see them again. So to have this opportunity to really study the snake in motion is, it's a first for me, and I've been out here years in the bush. Very, very unusual in a black mumbers case. You get to see puff adders, which are slightly more slow, or boom slungs. And Susan, you were wondering how far it could lunge if it wanted to. And virtual tourist, you were saying, how fast can it lunge? Um, because it makes you a little bit nervous. In terms of how far it can lunge, it can lift up about two thirds of its body weight and strike forwards. I can't remember the exact speed, but I can say that it's faster than any kind of lightning reaction that we might have. Luckily, my foot came down on the brake very quickly because I would hate to have injured the snake, which is what we would have done, which is why it reared up in the first place in terms of but we've not given the snake any reason to strike. We've also given it plenty of space now. It's moved off into the safety of this tree. It's still slightly flared around the neck, which I think is either in response to us or to some other kind of threat. I haven't seen any birds mobbing it. So I think it's still feeling slightly unsettled at our presence, but it's relaxed enough to be in that particular bush willow and not to have escaped off. In terms of the potency of the venom, Margaret wants to know which is worse. Is it a, a cobra or a mamba? And the answer is the mamba's venom is more deadly and it actually acts faster. The differences with cobras is they tend to come into contact with people more frequently. But again, when I say more frequently, I'm not saying this is a, a, a common occurrence at all. And it's only really where food has attracted rodents and rodents therefore have attracted the snake itself. Um, and the other thing of course with cobras, especially spitting cobras, is that as their name suggests, they spit. So their venom can actually travel further than this black mamba can strike. And it contains both neurotoxic and cytotoxic, so cell destroying aspects to it. And they have incredibly well practiced aim it's always important that you make sure you've got your eyes protected if you ever encounter a spitting cobra 
Now, if you ever come around the corner and you find yourself faced with a rearing black mamba, as we did, your best approach, or a rearing spitting cobra, your best approach is to remain absolutely still. If you're far enough away, so if you're more than, for example, I would say about six feet away from the snake itself, you can try and back off, give it as much space as possible, so that you don't provoke any kind of aggression towards you out of fear. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the snake is, want to, is going to want to move away from you. You just want to make sure that you don't corner it or threaten it in any way. This is incredible. I have never had a black mamba sighting like this in my life. The, co the camera's going to wobble a bit because since we started this sighting, I've had my foot on the brake and I haven't actually let the vehicle relax into the clutch. So you're going to get a bit of a jolt. There you go because my right leg is now cramping. <laughs> Instinctive foot on brake response. And monkey man and Ian, you're both sort of wondering a bit about the size. So I would say that the snake is two meters long. It's coiled up in the tree at the moment, but when it was spread out earlier, it looked to be about six feet or two meters in length from tip of tail to tip of snout. It is one of the biggest black mambas I have seen, which makes it absolutely stunning. Not many of them get to survive to this incredibly, incredible size. In terms of diameter, I'm trying to think of a nice comparison for you. Apart from my skinny wrist, which is about how thick it is, at its thickest point. Let me try and, Ian, let me try and give you a perspective, Tebs, if we can zoom out. I'll give you a rough idea in terms of my hands. So, Ian, at its thickest point, it's probably about close to the size of a tennis ball is maybe the nearest comparison I could give. That would be at its widest point, which is in the center of its body, and pure muscle. No, sorry, Tebs, you can go back. I'm, I'm done with my scale comparison. Just ducking my head out of the way. The strength of that body when it moved across, first of all, when it reared up in front of us, and second of all, when it moved into the tree, is breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking. Now, we don't know if it was out hunting or if it was basking, but if it was hunting and searching for some kind of meal, as I said, it doesn't look as though it's eaten recently. Kathy, you were wondering what do black mambas eat? And anything from rodents to birds, which is why they quite often get mobbed, although very carefully, by the bird species out here. They can eat birds, they, they will raid nests if they can. They will eat amphibians like frogs. And obviously for those tiny animals, an injection of that venom is almost an instant death. It's actually a fairly merciful one. The animal goes straight into paralysis and probably straight into shock as well for small animals of that size. Now the nice thing about mumbers of this length and this maturity is that they've got incredible control over their venom glands. So for a snake, producing venom is something obviously that their body has to put physical effort into. But quite often when they strike, when they are this size, because of the control that they have over the amount of venom they secrete, they will give you what's known as a dry bite if you are incredibly unfortunate and do get bitten. They do often dry bite, which is almost like a warning and a way for them to not waste their venom. And actually the more dangerous ones to catch are the babies that have no control over the amount of venom they produce. And Bethany, these snakes are incredibly comfortable 
in trees, but they generally hunt on the ground. It's more common to see them on the ground. You wanted to know if it's in the tree because of us. Yes, I think it is in the tree because of us, if I'm honest. Although it might be getting a nice perspective in the world. Hello. Yes, hello. <laughs> yes, you're beautiful. Looking at us through the branches. Bethany, I think it is at this point in the tree because of us. And once we finish with the sighting, what I'll do is I'll back off and give it plenty of space to decide where it wants to go from here. It would probably be more at home hiding in a termite mound or a termite hole or underneath a log. And I think the surprise of our arrival confused it a little bit. But because what was interesting was when we first arrived, it and it moved away from us when we first went live with this it slithered straight over a termite hole that it could have escaped into i'm not sure why that was i don't know if it was just slightly panicked at our presence felt scared but once we have finished off with the sighting then i will give it plenty of space to decide where it wants to go a snake like this is to be absolutely treated with respect. Jo both Joseph and Marisha were wondering if it has any kind of enemies. And Steve and Jenny, you've actually put your finger on one such enemy. Yes, a honey badger will tackle a black mamba although it will do so with severe caution. As you know, honey badgers tend to have quite a resistance to the venom of, black, of various snakes. Many of you will have seen that incredible clip of the honey badger that takes on, I think it's a cobra, and gets bitten, goes to sleep for a while, and then wakes up and eats the snake that it managed to kill. So they are phenomenal creatures in that respect, definitely with more resistance to the venom than we have. Other enemies it might have would be one of the eagle species, especially snake eagles that are specially adapted. That's why snake eagles don't have feathers on their feet. One of the, the reasons that biologists have suggested that snake eagles don't have feathers on their feet because they've specialized in hunting snakes so they can extend their feet and be able to look down on them. And then the one big enemy that we don't see that commonly here, but that we definitely could, is a secretary bird. A big tall bird, close to a meter and a half in height, with long, long bald legs that are equipped with powerful talons as a way of kicking and grabbing at snakes. And they are specialized snake hunters. I'll show you a picture when we've finished off with our snake sighting. This is just too amazing an opportunity to pass up. Uh, he's he or she, I've kept referring to him as a he, but to be completely honest, I have no idea. And Bob G, you were wondering if there's any way to determine the sex of a snake. And no, with mumbas and cobras and all of the um, newly evolved snakes or more advanced snakes, so not like a python, which is one of the oldest species of snake that we might get out here, which I'll get back to in a moment. But Bob, there's no way without examining the cloaca or the opening, which is, sits about two-thirds along the tail on the underbelly without being able to observe that opening you wouldn't be able to tell the difference and even then for both males and females their genitals are enclosed within that cloaca so it would be short of catching the snake and having a closer look or examining it under different conditions we wouldn't be able to tell they have no um, external dimorphism and there's no real link between size and gender. And one extraordinary thing to continue on with the 
discussion about the genitals is Nikki was wondering how snakes mate. And in this, in the case of black mamas, it's one of the most extraordinary spectacles to witness, especially with a snake of this size. And I wish, I don't have the picture on my phone anymore, but I've seen the most amazing photographs. What they do is they wrap themselves together and the male places his sexual organs or the opening for his sexual organs over the females and they have penises that can invert themselves and then penetrate the female. Very unusual to see. It can be quite a long process. It can be quite a, an involved process. Their courtship is also almost like a dance as they wrap themselves around each other. And just an interesting aside is that not all snakes lay eggs. I know that you were saying that most of them do. You are absolutely right. Most of them do. But some snakes are what is known as, oh, hold on a second. The brain has to work here. Oviviparous. Now what that means is that the, use, the youngsters develop in eggs within the, pre, the mother and then actually hatch before they are born. I'm fairly certain, I need to brush up on this now, and of course my brother would know, he, he was the snake expert in our family. Um, I'm pretty sure puff adders are oviviparous. I could stand corrected on this. For lumbers, they are they do lay eggs, as far as I know. You have to double check that though. I can't remember now which, off the top of my head, which snake species are lay eggs versus giving birth to live young. from Jim and why when we're looking at a grey snake or a sort of an olivey grey snake do I keep referring to it as a black mamba? Why is it called a black mamba? And the answer to that is what we, Tebs and I got to see which none of you did, was as it raised and flared that slight hood and opened its mouth to hiss at us as we came around the corner, the inside of their mouth is pitch black which is a very, very intimidating sight. I think fascinating to see. And that is where the black mamba name comes from. It's got nothing to do with the color of the snake. And it is deceptive. I can understand why when you hear the name black mamba, particularly with the reputation they inspire, you might be slightly afraid. It's okay, guy. It's all right. Okay, boy. But no, the name comes from the inside of their mouth. But their venomous cousins, the green mumbers, which we don't find here, are found more towards the coastal forests. Those green mumbers are called green because they are an electric green. A bit of confusion when these snakes were being named, but the olive grey mumba doesn't sound quite as intimidating as the black mumba. And I think that's why the name is stuck. And if you are confronted with one of these snakes feeling frightened and threatened, that is the first part that you see. And what I always find incredible is the way that their muscles are constructed, that they can drape themselves comfortably like this one has all over this tree, all over the branches and still hold its weight, hold its head up, the muscular structure and the skeletal structure working together to create that typical serpentine motion that we know so well is actually a wonder of nature. To be able to exert that amount of control over their bodies, we chat about it a lot when we talk about the elephant trunk, but sometimes I think maybe we neglect to consider what a beauty of evolution snakes bodies actually are so beautifully adapted oh and just to while i'm on that subject i chatted about pythons now pythons are one and or one type of snake i said that they are one of the older species that we get out here and what i mean by that is that they evolved sooner than snakes like this black mamba and you actually can see 
on the snake itself, on pythons, you can actually see residual stumps at the base close to the tail where they used to have legs. And it's one species of snake that you can actually, as far as I know, you can tell the difference between male and female by looking at the size of those stumps. So, obviously snakes evolved from reptiles like lizards that have legs. Now, snakes have the most extraordinary senses. Every now and again you'll see his tongue, forked tongue, flicker out and test the scent particles. And Tammy, you were wondering why he's doing that, he or she. And the answer is very similar to that Fleming grimace. Now we've spoken a lot before about the Fleming grimace in mammals, which is where they go and they test a scent and then they scrunch up their faces and that draws the scent particles into a specialized organ that sits on the roof of the mouth. Now in snakes, that organ is incredibly advanced. So at the top of his palate, he's got an organ known as the organ of Jacobson. And essentially what he's doing when he flickers his tongue out like that, or he or she, is to catch scent particles in the air and actually build up a picture of what's happening around him. It's almost like he can taste and see the smells. So what that's doing is adding to the perception and they've got very sensitive organs of Jacobson. Their senses of smell and taste are phenomenal. They've also got eyes, obviously they don't have external ears, but they do have ways of de detecting vibrations. And what's happening here is his brain is processing all of the information between the taste of the smells, if you can imagine it like that, the heat receptors that are around the snout, his vision, which is not as good as, for example, a bird, except the, the exceptions there are the tree snakes. So wormslungs and vine snakes have exceptionally good eyesight, but for mummers, their main perception of the world is in heat reception and smell and scent that they're tasting. Essentially, the snake is building up a picture of its world with its tongue. It's looking at us with its tongue, if you can imagine it like that. <laughs> Hello, Mario. Mario is our, one of our seven-year-old viewers. Mario, are you wondering why the snake is looking at us like it wants to eat us? And you're asking whether or not I'm scared. Mario, I'm not scared because he doesn't want to eat me. He wants to watch me. He wants to make sure that I'm not going to come and attack him. He's scared. He is far more scared than I am. And in fact, once we've finished off with this question, I'm actually going to back off and let him move away comfortably because I think he feels trapped in this tree with us being here and can't quite decide what to do. Mario, I'm far enough away that he can't get me. And snakes don't attack people. They bite people when they get scared and when they get trapped, but they're never gonna come out to try and attack us. We're not on their menu, they don't wanna eat us. So all he wants to do is make sure that I'm not going to shoot out and attack him. Now guys, this has been the most phenomenal opportunity to study what is an incredible creature but at this point i think mario's question is right the snake hasn't moved out of this tree so what i'm going to do we'll still stay with him but what i'm going to do is back up so that it can decide where it wants to go and let's see what the decision is made maybe we get to watch it move off completely peacefully but mario no i'm not scared he's not going to come and attack me it's just a matter of knowing a little bit about the way that snakes think and behave. I'm backing up slightly. I want to see what the snake decides to do. But we can actually watch, since we do have this incredible camera, we can watch from a 
dist a more comfortable distance for the snake and see what it decides to do. Let me duck my head down. Let's just have a look. Now we've given it plenty of comfort space. Where did it go? It's there somewhere. In the tree behind. There he is. Maybe it was in the tree because it wanted to be in the tree. Well, I know that we spoke about the various predators and prey species of these snakes. And of course, one thing I didn't touch upon was whether or not they would ever attack each other. Sabrina, I know you wanted to know if there's any snakes that do eat other snakes. And yes, a black mamba could actually quite possibly decide to devour one of the other smaller snake species. Fairly unusual, but it does happen. And there are certain snakes that are quite well adapted towards hunting each other. Now, as for whether or not a king cobra and a mamba, or a mamba could kill a king cobra, um, possibly, I don't think so though. And Joseph, I know you were wondering whether or not a mamba could kill a cobra. Yes, probably. Of course, each snake has a unique venom that they utilize. So although they might be immune to their own venom, I don't think that they carry immunity to other snakes' venom. That being said, it's unlikely that it would ever actually occur. I mean, if they have two snakes of equal size, which is, I assume, what you are thinking along the lines of, why take on a threat like that where you could run the risk of being seriously injured when there are other more harmless prey species to target and go after? And generally, these big snake species are very good at giving each other plenty of personal space. I've given him plenty of personal space, but he hasn't actually decided to leave the tree, which makes me think maybe, actually, it wanted to be up there, and it was comfortable and had discovered a nice vantage point, which makes me feel quite comforted. I'm glad to know that we didn't scare it unduly. I think if we had, and if it was up in that tree because of our presence, I think it would have taken this opportunity to shoot down and onto the ground. Definitely one of my most extraordinary snake sightings. It's not often that we get to spend this amount of time with such amazing creatures. A first for me, and I'm sure a first for most of you as well. There you go, I can see it still looking around with its head. What are you gonna do, buddy? Are you gonna come down? Or are you happy up there? looks like slowly starting to descend. Our, our view here, now that I've moved back, is not fantastic. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sit here for a little bit longer and wait until it starts to descend. But for the, in the meantime, Let's pop over to Brent, see what he's up to. I believe that he has some elephants to show you. And if anything ch changes, then we'll come right back across here. So, no luck on the leopard front, but we have come across a really big herd of Ellie's, probably about 40 or 50 of them, and really relaxed. So we're gonna pop into the bush with them now. find a spot where we can get ahead of them so they can walk around us. It's always better to let the animals come to you, uh, specifically with big animals like an elephant. Uh, I've read their body language already and they're nice and relaxed. That's the reason I'm, I'm off-roading. Um, if they'd shown us any signs that they weren't very relaxed, we wouldn't off-road um, after them. They're all off to the side here. I'm just gonna find a way around a slightly thicker area. Oh, we've got to be careful. Hard fast burrows abound. Good place to get stuck. If 
Uh, if we get stuck, we'll get Andrew to dig for us. I'm just going to turn on the virtual reality rig. That's uh, this little ball of cameras on the on the left-hand side of the car. You hear all the beep, beep, beep. There we go. And I'm just going to clap quickly. There we go. So there's elephants all around us. There's two having a little tussle over there. Looks like the youngsters just filled with the joy of morning. And a nice little group of babies off to the right. Also having a good little play. Now that head shake, you heard it. Wasn't it us? It's actually this other female seem to seems to be upset with this female. It's quite strange behavior here. Very interesting. So she's urinating. And these are really big females. I mean, very tall at the shoulder, these two. Maybe he's giving a, the other one a bit of a talking to. This is incredible. We are about to be absolutely surrounded by a big herd of eddies. And you see, paying us almost no attention. Just some curiosity from the youngsters, but mostly the, the big adult females here. We go. As I said, curiosity from the little ones. Hello, little one. Uh, the adults are just feeding around us. Oh, get ready, Andrew, up front is charging the other one. And here we go. Hello. Oh, isn't that sweet? Trunks entwined. No. Adolescent getting involved. <laughs> Rough and tumble. And as you can see, the Ellies are just moving slowly past us. We're going to sit here and just really enjoy this moment. And she's right next to Andrew, feeding off a zebra wood. Isn't that incredible? It's probably no more than six feet from Andrew at the moment, completely oblivious to us and just feeding away. And when you're in a situation like this and now we're surrounded by elephants, so if we have to start and move the car, uh, it might set them off. And this is how a lot of people uh, often think they're getting charged by elephants and whatnot. Often if you just sit still, and you can hear I keep the tone of my voice um, very, very calm and down, even though when I get excited when I see an Ellie doing that and start tapping Andrew on the leg, having a, a little bit of fun on that termite mound. And I, I think, there we go. It's a little girl, very playful little female. And, oh, look at, this, look at this little guy climbing. It's so busy, all the little Ellie's around here. And uh, oh, that cute, the pointing his nose at us, giving us a smell. And here we go, here comes a tuskless female. And it looks like she's been born without tusks. Hello, little one. We've got probably about eight, nine-year-old female here, right close to us. <laughs> Look at that, we're just surrounded by Eddies at the moment. So there's a big group, I mean, there's at least 30 or 40 here. And for those of you who are going on safari uh, and driving yourself around Kruger, 
rather be a little bit more cautious with elephants. Uh, we obviously spend a lot of time with elephants and uh, have a lot of experience in reading their behavior, but it's always better to err on the side of caution. Before I approach an elephant herd, I always watch them from a distance, and their body language always tells you uh, if they are in a good mood or a bad mood. And the same herd on a different day could behave completely differently. Now, a couple of telltale signs to look out for when an elephant's in a bad mood is that uh, they'll open their ears, raise their head. Uh, but one of the really, really, really important signs to look for is their tail. And their tail's hanging nice and loosely like that. They're nice and relaxed. Uh, when the tail starts getting a bit stiff and that, it's a sign of stress and, and that they're not very comfortable. Quite often, Ellie's, even when they are relaxed, when they walk up towards you, they will give you a head shake and whatnot, and that's just sort of letting you know that they're here and that they're big and you shouldn't mess with them. And quite often, if you just sit still, they'll relax down after that. There we go, there's a young bull coming through now. Well, Paul says sometimes he, he swears he can see the Ellie's smiling. Well, well, I'm smiling uh, just because this is such a wonderfully relaxed head. Now you see we've got a, a young bull, probably around 20 years old. Now he's showing that very distinct. You see how he's lifting his head a bit higher, opening his ears. What he is is making himself look bigger. Uh, as he walks past us, he might give us a little head shake or not. Oh, very interesting. See that female urinated a little bit earlier. He's now sniffing uh, and tasting her urine. And you'll see that quite often. He's probably testing to see if she's an estrus or can find out other information. Oh, we're getting stalked by a little male, but he's decided to go off. So, lov lovely bull, also quite a tall bull. We, it's amazing, we've been getting a lot of bulls at the moment, and I love big Ellie bulls. He's not too big yet. There he moves off, he looks like he's heading towards where those, that female that urinated was. This can get a, a bit interesting. Sometimes the females will see off bulls of this age, or try and move away from them, and you get some of that. Uh, screaming and yelling, which you get quite often from elephant herds. They've got such a vast array of noise uh, sounds that they make. So the majority of the herd has moved past us. So we've still got some off to the right here and to the left. There we go, there's another one there. Um, and we have noticed, uh, X Rang has noticed that a lot of the smaller eddies are weeping from the temporal gland. Uh, there's quite a few different reasons for this, but it is quite dry at the moment, uh, and they're having to travel big distances between water and food. So it could be a sign of, a, a little bit of a sign of stress uh, uh, when elephants start weeping from the temporal gland. Uh, it could be also a sign of uh, hormones changing. So uh, those adults, or uh, those babies getting a little bit closer to adulthood or adolescence, uh, sometimes you'll have quite a lot of weeping from the temporal glands there as well. So it could just be hormones. But most of them are past us. I'm just going to turn off our little ball of GoPros quickly. Um, and Andrew says I must clap again. And he wants me to clap multiple times. So if I look like a, um, uh, an idiot uh, clapping at a non-existent uh, performance, I apologize. Uh, Andrew wants bigger. Are you happy now, Andrew? Yes. There you go, Andrew's happy. Otherwise, apparently, uh, it makes life very difficult for the cameramen and the editors when they start stitching all those foot that footage together. So while we get into a, a nice position with these Ellie's again, uh, let's go back to Jamie, who's still with that magnificent and most deadly of African snakes, the Black Mamba. What's been really interesting about this, now that I've given the snake some more space to see if it decided to go down the tree, is that it actually hasn't moved. It's been quite content to drape itself over the branches, and that is where it wants to be at the moment. I'm still, I've still given it some space, so we don't have the same view of it that we did before. But what an amazing mo amount of time we've got to spend. This is by far the longest black mamba sighting I've ever had in my life. 
And I've got a really interesting question and one that I don't know the answer to. Eric, Eric has raised the point. We spoke about why it's called a black mamba. Why is it called a mamba at all? Where does the name mamba came from? And I jokingly suggested that maybe it was the dance moves that Tebs and I performed when we first came around the corner. And I have to tell you, I wish we'd had a GoPro on the car because it would have been highly entertaining to watch. Tebs has done a fantastic job of being able to now keep the camera steady and give us these incredible visuals that we have been getting. So a big well done to Tebs for these incredible shots. But I don't know. I really honestly have no idea where the name Mumba comes from. I don't know if any of you guys know, if I can put it out to you as a question as to where you think it might come from. If it's maybe a derivative of one of the local words for the snake. I can hear a ground hornbill as well. That's another predator of a black mamba. Fierce snake hunting birds. And when I say I can hear them, it's very faint, but it's a sound that goes We've been lucky enough to watch some of them calling recently. I wonder if it's our trio that's been hanging around quarantine. When I'm glad that you are as spellbound as I am by this incredible black mamba sighting that we've been having. And you've asked a, a really interesting question as well about how fast the snake is processing the information that's coming through from the organ of Jacobson. So with that flickering tongue, tasting the air and getting a perception of the world around it, how fast does that happen? When I would suggest, I don't know for certain, I would suggest that it is as instant as mammal vision or as close to instant as we can possibly get, especially with the space between the organ and the brains. Obviously, nerves transmit signals fairly at a fairly standard rate, provided they are... Oh, gosh, I have to go back to my biology. The ones wrapped in fatty nodes. Oh, goodness. OK, let's not go into that much detail because I have to be honest, I don't remember it like I used to back when I used to chat a lot about the structure of nerves. But I guess when you're asking about what happens once that sensory input hits the brain, given the speed that snakes can strike at, given the speed of their reflexes, and given the importance of being able to respond to the sensory input in order to catch prey, my guess would be that it's instant. In fact, I wouldn't even be surprised if it's faster than mammal vision because we, our brain has to take time to invert the image that we're seeing. So obviously we actually, with the way that our eyes are shaped, we actually see what we see upside down and our brain flicks it, turns it the right way up. Maybe it processes even faster than we do. Are you going to come down now or are you quite happy up there? Joe, Joe Ellen has seen that hood that flared up. It's very slight in mumbers. It's not the same as, for example, a spitting cobra or a um, snouted cobra even, although snouted cobra's hoods are a bit smaller. And you've said, apart from looking intimidating, what is the purpose behind the hood? As far as I know, that is the one purpose. It just looks terrifying. It makes the snake look bigger and it has a startle effect. So as soon as it flares out like that, it has a way of quite possibly deterring a possible predator by threatening like that. I'm not sure if they have any function in mating displays, which would be the only other reason. Maybe the big male with the biggest hood has a better chance of the female, but I'm not sure, I don't think so. 
I would, I'm happy to stand corrected in that respect, though, if any of you know anything more about the hoods of animals like cobras. It is fascinating the different methods. I know many of you will be watching in the States and you know all about the rattle of the rattlesnakes, a way of intimidating and passing on a warning without having to risk an attack or waste precious venom. Mumbas and cobras have hoods. Black mumbas have that, that mouth that is so dark in color that it stands out as a really intimidating factor. Puff adders puff. That's why they call puff adders out here. They make a sort of a, a hissing, puffing sound. <laughs> My poor parents, I must tell you, they have at times, I think I've put them through extraordinary, terrifying moments because apparently when I was a child, now puff adders, to give you, a, they, they're a complete different snake to the black mumbas we're looking at. They're short, squat snakes. Hello, Let me turn the range down. Sorry, guys. Oh, yes, so puff adders are quite thick, stout snakes and their venom is cytotoxic and they're fairly docile or they generally tend not to move out of people's way and that's one of the reasons why they're responsible for the most bites in Africa. Their venom, as I said, is cytotoxic so there's plenty of time to get a victim of those puff adder bites to hospital. And the only reason really is that they are, first of all, the most widely distributed but also they tend not to move out of the way as mumbas and cobras tend to do. And apparently my parents and my grandfather found me quite happily playing with a puff adder when I was a small child, sitting at the bottom of my grandfather's garden, which he then removed for us. And I, I seem to remember I got a smack on the bottom for that. Although I, at the time, completely didn't understand why. Of course, my parents teaching me a very important lesson. Luckily, that puff adder was completely docile and let me play with it. I do think though that I have been responsible maybe for one or two gray hairs on my poor parents. Luckily, I have been incredibly supportive of my lifestyle. Ramona, I'm going to leave the snake now. And Ramona wants to know whether or not I will warn the other guides of the danger of this mumba. Ramona, um, no, I don't think I will. I don't think that it is too much of a threat. There's no guides in the immediate vicinity. I'm always keeping an ear on the Game Drive channel. If I see one of them, I might tell them. But I strongly suspect that once we leave this area, or if a car were to approach this area, that snake would move out of the way completely. But the distance of that tree to the road is no longer a dangerous one. So there's plenty of space. Um, there's no way, it's unheard of essentially for a black mamba to attack someone in the car. There you can see there's a nice comfortable distance between where the road is and where the snake is. And I suspect once we leave, he will make a decision about where he would like to go. But this has been the most amazing moment spent with a really fantastic creature. I'm going to leave it be now. And thank you, Snake, for the time we got to spend looking at you. And while I pull off, I'm going to send you back over to Brent. So we're still with this big breeding head of elephants. And Mr. Rinkley Bottom is here. And that's his mom with those nice long tusks. And there he is just behind her, not performing for us yet. Oh, look at that. She's reaching up to grab those marula branches, deciding, no, not tasty enough. Oh, we've got elephants on both sides of us now, passing. Incredible. Lots of little ones, so lots of boisterousness and movement around this herd. Any pines wondering, do I keep talking because it calms all the ellies? Um, yes and no, Ken. Uh, I mean, we could sit quietly in there. With this herd, I think they'd probably behave exactly the same. Oops, sorry. Into. 
but in certain circumstances, if the animal is slightly not relaxed, uh, sometimes there's talking and keeping your voice in a very calm one uh, just helps relax them and keeps them calm. Keeps Often when you're actually on safari with real people, uh, a lot of the, the voice uh, control is to keep the guests calm. <laughs> uh, if you're not used to it, being six feet away from an African elephant can be incredibly intimidating. So, this herd's initially a lot bigger than I thought, and there's more that keep coming. There's probably about 60 or 70 Ellie's here now. Everywhere we look, there's another little group or a tiny little guy coming through. And it's mom, mom of that little guy is a tuskless female. So she looks like she's been born without tusks. Uh, that is not that unusual. It, it does happen quite often. Uh, it is a genetic thing. So, And she's still able to, to feed and survive with not too much effort. This is a wonderful big herd, Eddie's. This Ellie here right in front of us, it's disappearing behind one of my favorite bushes normally at this time of year. But unfortunately, there's no fruit on it. Sour plum. Normally, there'd be nice big fruits on it. And uh, Andrew and I would be making funny faces because they're incredibly sour. Uh, they start all sweet and then go very, very sour. It's the name of sour plum. That's a little female here. couple of little babies, there we go, and spotted him as well, same time as me. And Shell in Detroit is wondering at what age do the Ellie's start learning to control their trunk like the adults? Well, Shell, it's uh, probably within about three or four months, they have a lot more control of what they do, but by six months, I'd say, they've, they've learned how to use their trunk quite effectively. But still, I'd say, at a year, I would say they probably mastered it. At this age here, I would say both of these guys are under six, or actually the closest to this, that one we're on now there, probably about six months old. The other one a little bit older. Sorry, the bigger one about six months old. Sorry, I got it confused. And the smaller one a little bit younger. Look at this. Chewing on a whole tree. Why break it when you can just bend it and chew on the whole branch? And think about it. If we listen carefully, there's 60 or 70 elephants around us. And how little noise do they make? Peering out of the bush around us. Ah, there we go. Uh, it's broken the branch now, finally. I can hear more coming from behind. Angela says this Ellie needs a toothbrush. Well, I think it's got a toothbrush there. It's a really big one, Angela. That's wonderful. Let's just try and move forward a little bit. There we go. Another big female coming through from the back there. And a little one 
in the middle, trying to use its trunk to grab that branch. It must be incredibly frustrating for a little elephant. It's like, I can do it, I can do it. No, I can't. I'm moving on. I stand behind mom. Insomniac says, somehow the Ellie's make the leaves look delicious. Uh, now, Insomniac would like to go out for a salad. Well, wait till the end of drive, stay with us for the rest, and then you can go have a salad, Insomniac. Nice big old female walking past us here. periphery of the main sort of body of the herd. They've moved in some very thick bush. And we will stay with them. Oh, here comes trouble, I think. Little guy. Looks like he's up to mischief. her foot against the tree. Now her bum. So if you're an elephant, any big tree is a convenient scratching post. That's very interesting, Andrew. Yeah? Uh, put its trunk down. So very, very interesting. That elephant standing right next to us here, there's a hole in that marilla tree and it put its trunk in there and just started sniffing. But uh, it's taking its trunk out now. Brazo would like to know if I've seen the elephant with a collar. Uh, Brazo, there's a few Ellie's with collars. Um, I have not seen an elephant with a collar in this. <laughs> Look at that little one again. Oh, we're getting charged, Andrew. Big scary charge. <laughs> That's definitely, oh, it's a little girl. I thought that was, that baby was a little boy. That's normally very much little teenage boy or little boy behavior. But that was a, that was a little girl. Very brave girl. Almost expected, Almost on the rampage again. Oh, not, that was quite an unceremonious kick there. Stop it, behave yourself, doof. charge off that way now. Let's go charge the other baby. <laughs> let's see, let's just try and move forward a tiny bit. on again and I'll do the clapping at the end of this one so Jim Butler is wondering uh, is the matriarch of the herd a hello uh -uh, uh -uh. good girl I think that was just a bit more of curiosity more than anything else there was no aggression in it I need possibly saw that VR rig and thought, what is that? I must inspect. Uh, but Jim Butler is wondering how the matriarch of the herd is determined. Is it by age or the other factors? Uh, Jim, I think it's mostly by age. Uh, the older females have more experience and have been around longer and know uh, what's going on. Oh, there's a lovely little one there. And there's about four or five actually in this little group off to the front left of us and we've got another elephant a young bull coming in right behind us it's right behind andrew now hello little man 
Oh yeah, he's a teenager. And I'm just gonna try to get him through there now. There he goes. Teenage bull. Okay. The bigger female also adopting the same. Let's chew the tree while it's still attached. And what they're doing there is they're going for that what's called the cambium layer, which is the layer just under the outer bark that transports the nutrients and minerals and water from the roots of the tree uh, to the leaves and the rest. And that obviously is the most tastiest part for an elephant. And look, she's gonna do it again. Isn't that incredible? Rather than breaking. So we'll be back shortly, but Jamie's got an incredible bird on the ground. Remember when we spoke this morning about the fact that birds of prey, battleers and tawny eagles scavenge off carcasses? What on earth has this one found? I wanted to just show you this. I will move up to investigate in a moment. There's something large lying there. I wonder, is there a way? Why is this one on the ground? Why is this kill not being consumed? I think it might be a kudu. We are going to go up close to investigate. I just wanted to show you these birds of prey coming down to scavenge. Not something that we get to see commonly. Now, why and where is the animal responsible for this particular kill? Now, we're just going to watch that for a moment while I just scan the trees in the area with my binoculars. But keep your eyes peeled. Generally, a bird on the ground like that feeding off a carcass means that the predator has, is not in attendance. And it could be, maybe if he's a leopard kill and the leopard's gone off for a drink or something similar. I will go up and investigate. I just want to show you the way that this battalier is feeding and scavenging. They're also one of the most beautiful and striking birds with a bright orange face. This looks like a male to me. One of the few bird species that you can actually tell the difference between a male and a female. The males have less pale coloring on their wings. And towards the end of those wingtips, if it were a female, it would have white along the wings. Now, to go and investigate, we will have to chase it away. So I'm just going to give it a bit more time to feed. And we don't often get to see this, so it is an incredible sight to see. Look at the way it's working with its legs to try and balance and get good leverage. Now, they're not built like vultures. Oh, it is a kudu. I saw the leg move there. I'm almost certain that's what it is. Now, they're not built like vultures. Those beaks are not really built for scavenging and breaking into big carcasses. Usually they target the softer areas around the eyes or if the kill has been opened by one of the whatever was feeding on it. But you can see how it's struggling to tear pieces of meat off. They're not built in quite the same way with those powerful beaks that white back vultures and lapid face vultures are. Wow, we've been so lucky this morning. This has been incredible. And the reason I'm not rushing in, apart from not wanting to disturb the battalier, although it will come back as soon as we leave, is the fact that it's on the ground tells me that the predator concerned, if it indeed it was a predator that has resulted in this kill, is not here. Leopards tend to get fairly defensive of their meals. But let's go in and investigate now. Let's go find out what's happening. The battalier will return to the carcass. It's going to fly away now while we go and investigate, but it will return as soon as we depart. Let's try and find a way in here. There we go. Oh, Rusty, don't do this to me. Let's try and reverse. There we go. What extraordinary luck we've had this morning just by sheer luck and by the way ironically we're on mumba road just as a minor interesting fact 
let's go and figure out what's been happening. Keep your eyes peeled as we move in. Might be a leopard resting in the shade somewhere. Checking at all of the bases of the trees. What have we got here? to be able to get close enough to see the colouring of the battle ears. And yes, absolutely, we're so lucky that we've had this camera with us. We've had the most incredible sightings to explore. This is very interesting. What have we got here? Now this to me is a like an Anyala. Difficult to tell. It's actually quite in quite bad condition. I just want to double check. It doesn't look as though it's a kill. The fact that not much is fed on it, you can only see the rib parts and a bit of the leg where the scavengers have eaten away at it. The stripes on the fur looks like an Anyala. Now this is a mystery. There's no bite marks. It doesn't look like there's bite marks around the neck. It's quite, it's not a fresh carcass. You can see it's started to bloat. Hmm. This is interesting. I don't think this has been killed by a predator. Monkey man and Joseph, you're both thinking along similar lines to what I am. And that is that maybe it was killed by either a snake bite or disease. There's the female battalier, well spotted Tebs. We see them regularly on this road, this mated pair. There you can see that white strip along the bottom of the wings that we were chatting about. So this is the mate of the battalier that we were watching earlier. Now, you'll notice I'm not jumping out to go rushing to investigate that carcass. I won't be touching it. In drought season, the times like this, unexplained deaths are usually best avoided in terms of contact with them. Luckily, we've got a perfectly good view from here. The reason I say that is occasionally in drought times like this, although I think it would be very unlikely in this particular case, but at times of the year like this with drought, there's always a chance that anthrax has played a role, which is why I'm not going to go and touch the carcass. I'm not going to go explore it with my hands, as I otherwise might have been more comfortable to do. Luckily, we've got a nice view of it. Snake bite is a possibility. It does happen out here. It's unusual because the animals are so well accustomed to negotiating the various dangers of the bush life. And they generally avoid snakes, but that is a possibility. Um, and the other one is some kind of disease. And because I don't know, and because I can't see any evidence of how this particular Inyala died, I'm not going to make any attempt at trying to investigate the carcass, but really interesting, interesting stuff. And a perfect demonstration of what I was chatting about earlier, of the way that the raptors are opportunists in feeding off carcasses. Really, really interesting. And I've said that it's that the battalier was scavenging. Nisa, who's watching in Wisconsin, you were wondering if the battalier could have killed the Anyala. Nisa, no. It, the battaliers are a bit small in that respect. The only real raptor that is quite famous for killing antelope is one of the martial eagles because they're so big. And even then, Anyala is quite a substantially sized antelope. This is close to an adult female from what I can see. 
it would be a bit too much for that bird to be able to have killed. It does happen. Booted eagles, long-crested eagles, martial eagles are all known for taking small species of deer, but I'm talking maybe a baby impala or something the size of a steenbok. And a nyala is much bigger and much more powerfully built. So for the birds of prey like bataliers, they're more specialized in hunting things like snakes and, ooh, oh, <laughs> smell just hit me. Um, less so with the antelope species. You do get to see them though, it's often the first indication that there's some kind of kill on the ground. Well, how interesting has this been? Very, very interesting. And as I said, I'm not going to go and investigate any closer. Still looking. x ranger it might have broken a leg. Uh, it's hard to tell. I mean, I can't see any external... It's difficult because it's been scavenged on, obviously. But yes, a broken leg could result in a death. Or maybe some kind of blunt force trauma. Sometimes they do fall down. They can injure themselves. Unusual, but it does happen. And Lucy. Uh, Lucy in Indiana was wondering whether it wasn't maybe the Inyala that went through Viam's car window. And as far as I know, Lucy, that Nyala, when they managed to get it out of the vehicle, was still very much kicking. It's possible that we're very far away. We're pretty much as far as we could get from where that particular accident happened. It flies all over the place. Thank you. I prefer it if you weren't on my face. Oh, fire-grilled burnet. Beautiful burnet moth. It's a daytime moth species. You're okay, you can, you can stay. It's just the flies I prefer not to have. Beautiful, the way it wings catch the shimmer of the sun. Ready? Oh, we've been so lucky with the stuff we've seen with this camera. I'm trying to keep it in the place for Tibbs to be able to gone <laughs> flew off and it's called a fire grid burnet moth one of the few daytime moth species that we have out here back to the mystery of the nyala i think it's unlikely if that nyala was badly injured in that accident with viam and brent that was completely unexpected i don't think she would have moved from we're about easily three kilometers away which is somewhere in the region of one and a half miles i don't think it is that same in yala possible but highly highly unlikely and colleen you were wondering if maybe it was killed by the black mamba we are somewhere in the region we must be about in a straight line maybe 500 meters away not impossible that it was the reason behind this Nyala's death. But as I said, it's quite unusual for animals. It does happen. Quite unusual for them to die of snake bites, though. And in terms of not being found by scavengers, a really good point raised that wild dogs or hyenas, typically wild dogs less so in terms of scavenging. They tend to focus more on making their own fresh kills. But I am surprised the hyenas haven't found it. It could be because they are so distracted by that hippo that is on Torchwood. So Shirley and Pam, you were wondering why it is they haven't been found by scavengers. Sometimes it does just happen that way. As it was, the bataliers have been incredibly fortunate to be able to feast on this unencumbered. And there's birds of prey, mostly with vultures, but quite a few raptor species are much more resistant to the strains of disease out here, especially vultures in particular. It's something that scientists have been doing plenty of research into in terms of the way that their immunity works. So they can scavenge on this particular animal. If it was, for example, if it were bitten by a snake, that meat could still be ingested. In theory, you could actually, as long as you didn't have this is this is in theory i please don't take this as advice i would not suggest in any way that you try it in theory you could swallow snake venom as long as you didn't have cuts or bruises or any kind of weakness in your mouth 
and your body would simply digest it because it's protein. So it's something that is broken down by the body itself. You know that as soon as protein hits the stomach acid, it immediately denatures and loses its shape. And that's the way that venom works. So that means that even if an animal like this had been bitten by a snake, its flesh could still be safely consumed by whatever animals happen to come, ac come across it. And because it's protein as well, as soon as the decomposition process happens, so as soon as temperatures start to raise within the body itself, it's all part of the bacterial breakdown, as soon as that happens, then you get to the point of the proteins of the snake venom denaturing in the same way they do when they meet the acid. Well, interesting, there's no sign of any predators, there's no sign of any kind of predatory attack. I don't think the Sinyala was killed by predators. As to the reason behind its death, it will remain a mystery to us. <laughs> and Kim V, maybe we should get CSI or somebody to figure out what happens or what has happened to this poor Inyala and the reason behind its death. As it was, I certainly won't be conducting any autopsies at this time of year and during a drought. I'm not in a mad rush to go and investigate. Interesting stuff, though. I'd be very... going to be one of those mysteries, I think, forever afterwards. Sorry, I was just double checking. I saw movement in the bushes, but I think it was just a bird. And Brenda and Hazel, you've suggested another possibility for our mysterious death, that maybe it was death during labor or birth or stillbirth. Also possible, no sign of any fetus, although I haven't investigated from the opposite end. I can't see any sign of it. It does occasionally happen in breached births that the mothers then die in the process. It's hard to tell because this Inyala's stomach contents are still present, so it's very bloated in terms of the decomposition that's been happening. Interesting, interesting stuff. Sorry, girl. Not sure what happened to you, but I guess whatever it is is the end. No sign of any other predators around. I think I'm going to leave since the battaliers are still hovering around. You can't see them at the moment, but they've been flying over ahead. Now, uh, if it is discovered by some kind of scavenger, or if, for example, an interesting technique to Rusty's immobilizer, which I sometimes haven't quite got, well, we'll finish up with that question until I can actually start the vehicle. Um, in answer to that quest, the question about whether or not something like a leopard would chase off scavengers, so scavenging birds, yes, they definitely would. And that's why I approached the sighting as I did, because I actually figured that if there, is, there, if there was a predator that had killed this before we knew exactly what had happened, it would not be in the vicinity, because it's quite uncommon to see scavengers on the kill itself when the predators are still in attendance. Now, if hyenas were to come along, they would also chase the birds of prey away. Um, and lions do it all the time, sometimes even when they're completely full and don't actually want to eat, they're very, very protective over their carcasses. Oh, I'm not sure, but I think in order to move... Oh. Magic! Magic, magic. All good. I'd like to claim that I understand the pattern behind that, but honestly, I really don't. Let's try and negotiate our way back out of this particular block. And now, let's leave the battaliers to their snack as well. point whether I would tell any of the authorities about the carcass so that it could be checked for anthrax. Now I strongly, I think it's, the chances are very, very slim. Now for new viewers, sorry, while I'm doing this, I know it's very noisy and it looks um, 
it looks like I'm damaging these trees. I'm picking the species that will bounce back, and they will bounce. We're also very careful not to drive over any of the slow-growing or endangered tree species. So essentially, we pick roots where we know that the species of tree that we're going over will spring back, they're resilient. And that is what are known as bush encroacher species. So there's actually lots of them. Heidi, uh, yes, I'm going, to, I'm going to mention it. And I know exactly where it is, just in case. I think that the chances are absolutely very slim. We're still not quite in the worst part of the drought yet but it's not worth taking the chance. So I'll mention it and allow the authorities to make a decision as to what they do with it. It's always worthwhile just because we found something like that. It doesn't do any harm to let people know, especially if it, that will then be to the benefit of the environment. As we continue on our search for other wonderful things, because we've had such good luck today, I believe that Brent has found some tracks that he'd like to show you. So, a uh, really fresh set of leopard tracks. I think it's Karula. Uh, we've been following them for a while, uh, and they've now just left the road. You can see she walks through here, and then the tracks, as she gets onto the harder ground, become much more hard to spot. I actually saw one, now I've lost it. Ah, oh, there we go. And you can see it almost disappears there. She's gone straight across, down into this open area. This is quite a big area with no roads, but we're gonna check around this edge quickly. Uh, I've followed her here before where she's hunted like this, termite mound, termite mound, termite mound. So I'm hoping she possibly pops up on, on Rebecca's road. If she doesn't, I will go around and do Zoe's. A very, very fresh set of tracks. Um, can't see any little insect tracks from the night on top of them. And so I'm pretty sure Karula has been chased from that area where we were looking for her and she's made her way here. There's just been so many elephants around, those huge herds, uh, that it's, what, it's probably why we couldn't see the tracks this morning. There's just elephant tracks everywhere there. So keeping a sharp eye out on the road. I'm just gonna update the game drives. Uh, I know everyone's quite desperate for leopard at the moment. So let's see if anyone wants to come give us a hand. Gonzo of the Duanzati Ingwe head north into the block from the junction of Rebecca's Zoe's Road. I'm going to check with uh, Rebecca's through to quarantine. Okay, so we're going to be looking carefully and uh, see, check all these termite mounds. No Karula likes sitting on two arms. There goes one of Karula's favorite food species. And that's why she loves this, these areas, these crests. They're full of little stembok and dica. Checking very carefully. Uh, Jamie's gonna come give us a hand in the area. The more eyes, the better. Uh, that would be much appreciated. Uh, I think if you can check Western Edge of Quarantine, even we'll tell our access up to Zoe's. On that big block between Access, Rebecca's and Zoe's. Okay, so come on Andrew, you haven't spotted a leopard in so long, I wonder why you sit back there. Time to get your eyes working. Lots 
lots of zebra tracks on the road, no leopard tracks yet. We all know how Krula loves a good termite mound. So I'm checking the termite mounds quite carefully. says from those small feet she really hopes it's the queen of Juma. Uh, I tend to think it is Anne-Marie just from the area where it is and the size of the tracks. Krula has got petite little feet. Those tracks are very fresh but I don't get any luck on the roads around here. I think I might go for a stroll. Beautiful morning for a walk and I love walking with tracks. So again, guys. So, while we are searching for a leopard, uh, Jamie's got the leopard's... How do I'm going to say this now? Uh, the leopard's equivalent in the small five. give Brad some time to go searching for the leopard. In the meantime, we've got a leopard of a different kind to show you, this lovely leopard tortoise. And we've been so lucky with the sightings that we've had this morning with this incredible camera, You're able to see the way its head is stretched out. And I love watching the way that those scaly legs move. And you can really see how the scales on the front of the legs are so much thicker and harder than those on the back of them so that when it folds itself up into the shell, those scales are the ones that cover up the entrances. So unlike hinge tortoises that actually do have a hinge, you can see how it's adapted to have a protective covering all around if it needs to dip into its shell. And looking at it now, we can almost see under its plastron, which is the lower half of the shell, Iggy, yes, we seem to be on a roll. We are so lucky. We really, really have been so incredibly lucky. I'm trying to see if we can spot if it's a male or a female. Best way to do that is to look at the underside of the shell or the plastron. And in males, it is slightly curved, so slightly concave up towards the belly as a way of making mating with a female easier. As you can imagine, mating in tortoise world is quite a tricky business. The plastron of the female, on the other hand, is completely flat. Now, I watched the most extraordinary tortoise fight the other day. It was nice to see them moving out and about. I'm going to go forward a little bit so maybe we can get a different view, different perspective. And maybe we can even get a little bit closer and have a look at the real detail in that shell. Because they are such amazing creatures and we've had such wonderful opportunities. Oh, don't hide away. It's okay. Please don't hide trying to disappear into a patch of grass, somewhat unsuccessfully, but look at that. Look at the ridges on the scoots or the shoots, the keratin covering on the outside of the shell, those scaly-like protuberances. You can see why it's called a leopard tortoise now with that coloring. And those tiny little ridges are the way that the tortoise has grown. That's what they're caused by. So in summer, obviously, they grow much faster than they do when they are estivating in winter. And so their outside protective covering grows very fast. And you get those ridges, much like rings in a tree. And Joseph, it might be a way of, in a way, determining how old a tortoise is, but it doesn't quite work like rings on a tree. It's not exactly the same. And the reason behind that is the layers start to rub smooth. Now, I'm no expert at aging tortoises. My guess is this is quite a big tortoise uh, for a leopard tortoise, and they are very long-lived animals. I would guess that this tortoise is over 20 years old, if not closer to 30. It is a guess. I wouldn't claim to be an expert in aging leopard tortoises, but they grow very, very slowly. But you can't count the ridges on the scales like you can. Oh, you can, but it's not going to give you an accurate representation. 
rocks, as I said, as they move through the bush and are exposed to the elements, those ridges along the shell start to rub smooth. <laughs> are you hiding? We see you. We do see you, believe it or not. You can see how on the top of the each little ridge, each little, I don't know what you call it, in the center of each mound on his shell, it's not the world's best way of describing it, but you know what I mean. You can see how those have rubbed bald, and you can't see any ridges along it. So if we were to count the ridges, we'd put this tortoise somewhere in the region of about 15. I would say it's closer to 25, 30. Nice big individual. And exciting to see them moving out and about. You never know, it might mean rain for us all. It's that time of year where it has been threatening, but not delivering. Rianne, yes, we're really lucky. We've been seeing quite a few cute tortoises recently. And my favorite tortoise sighting was the two hinged tortoises I saw in quarantine fighting. I will put a video up of that at some point that I managed to get. What are you doing? I'm trying to disappear. You've chosen the thickest patch of grass you could find. Insomniac, you were wondering what it was doing. I think it's trying to hide. It could also be searching for shade. The temperature has increased astronomically since we first went out this morning and we encountered that black mamba probably basking in the road. It's now very hot. And as with the black mamba and all reptiles, the Chelonians as well, as in that's the tortoises and the terrapins that we get to see, they are ectotherms. So it could be he's also looking for a cool patch of shade to drop its body temperature down. Now there's two possible explanations. One is trying to hide from us. And I think he's doing, he or she, is doing a little bit of both. Nuzzled its way into the patch of grass, sorry. And Joseph, I mentioned that these tortoises are very long-lived, and you've asked whether or not it's true that they can live up to their hundreds. With certain tortoise species, absolutely. So those incredible tortoises on the Galapagos Islands have been recorded to live well over 100 years old. To the best of my knowledge, the life expectancy for a wild leopard tortoise is just under 100 years. So I think it's somewhere around 70, 70 odd years. That's as far as I know. I wouldn't be surprised if there were individuals that actually have lived longer and haven't been recorded as such. But as far as I know, for a slightly smaller species like the leopard tortoise, it's slightly shorter, but very close, very, very close to up to 100 years. Slow growing, amazingly cleverly evolved reptiles. And that shell that we're looking at at the moment that's covered in, covered in the keratin, that's essentially his spine and his ribs fused together to create that tough covering and then covered in a layer of keratin, just like the horns of antelope, to make one of the most intelligent, protective designs that the animal kingdom has to offer. Now, if, let's say, for example, because we always worry when there's big fires, let's say, for example, a fire came rushing through now, unlikely, because there's not much burning material, but tortoises are so clever in the respect that they can't escape them, I'm sure many of you know how fast fires can move through areas like this. But on a hot, windy day with a fire burning through, it will rush past the tortoise. The tortoise will retreat into its shell. And its protective design is so cleverly designed that it will actually, if the fire moves fast enough, it will be able to survive that. And of course, wildfires do happen out here. It just goes to show what an ingenious system of defense they have evolved. Very cool. Oh, bye. Well, since he's wanting to play hide and go seek with us, although I feel as though we've won that particular game, I'm going to leave him be to burrow into his patch of shade. Let's go and help Brent for the last few moments of the sunrise safari, see if we can follow up on Karula. He did ask me for help. We got a bit distracted. Goodness, be 
speed up ever so slightly. chatting about reptiles in response to my question about whether or where the name mamba came from and penny adam and a couple of others have actually sent through that it comes from the zulu word imamba so that's really useful thank you i we suspected that was the case but i wasn't sure i really was not entirely sure so imamba the zulu word for the mamba and of course, Zululand being the home of both the black and the green mamba in certain areas. You know, it's so funny. I nearly took the snake book out of Brent's vehicle this morning. And I wish I had it with me now. He's got it. Or he's got the reptiles book. <laughs> the dangers of communal book owning. just have to tune in or for the sunset drive to see some nice pictures of black mumbas versus green mumbas. But thank you everyone for those updates on the naming of the mumba. I've learned something new today. In combination with having one of the most awesome black mumba sightings I've ever had. Inyala sighting. Julie was wondering, there's a cuckoo there, but it's not going to not going to play nicely. No, unfortunately not. I wanted to show you it was a levelance. A levelance cuckoo. Not one that we've got to see all that often. Sorry, so Julie, you were wondering with that Inyala, if if there was a small chance that it did have anthrax and Karula consumed it or any one of its damages, would they contract anthrax? Not necessarily. There is a chance. Uh, there's quite a good chance, but there's also a chance that they wouldn't. They do have an immunity. Anthrax is a naturally occurring disease out here. It's one of the ways of population control and of course it always, there are always outbreaks, outbreaks in the drought season because the spores that have been lying dormant start to take hold. Yes, there is a chance, but at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if there are degrees of relative immunity in that respect. I wouldn't worry too much about Karula or that carcass. I don't think it's likely that it has anthrax, but I will report it anyway, just in case, and you'll probably find that it does get removed and then burnt, just in case. We'll have to find out what they decide to do. And speaking of Karula, Brent is on the other side of Juma, hot on her tracks. Let's find out how his progress has been. So we haven't found any tracks of a Queen Karula coming out of that area. Um, I'm going on a hunch, and quite often hunches and tracking on the way forward. So she's got a full belly, we saw that yesterday. She's walked quite far from where we saw her closest water is Gallego and she does like this area so I'm going to have a quick look at the pan uh, before heading she might have changed direction headed down towards Philemon's uh, dip but we'll go have a look there just now maybe I'll ask Jamie to go have a look Jamie Jamie what's your position Would you mind going down to check towards uh, Philemon's dip? Uh, I don't have any tracks coming out to Western Edge quarantine um, or we'll take access. I'm just checking Gallagher at the pan quickly. So, Jamie's going to go have a look there. It gives us a little bit more time to concentrate and focus on this area around camp. Uh, and you know she pops out here quite often. So if there's any new viewers or people just joined us, 
Can you believe it? Uh, my name's Brent, and you're on a live African safari with me. The magnificent Juma Private Game Reserve, part of the Greater Kruger National Park. And to make it even more amazing, you're able to ask us questions about what we're doing or what we're seeing, or anything you might have pondered about the great, vast African wilderness. That by simply using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can pop an email to me on questions at wildearth.tv. So, while we're in search of one big cat, Johnny Ringo is wondering if there's any updates on the Kahumas. And Johnny, I actually haven't heard an update. I was on leave for quite a while, but still I haven't heard an update for quite some time. And as we come here, there's so much fresh elephant dung and footprints that I think even if she had come here, setting tracks is going to be a bit difficult. So I'm going to just check a little bit of a wider loop. Elephants. One of my favorite smells. Uh, even though we are smelling their feces a lot of the time, very, very much a bush smell. It reminds me that I'm very lucky to live and work in the bush. I wouldn't want to have it any other way. I don't think I could live anywhere where there weren't elephants. Cat says, uh, quoting Forrest Gump there, uh, Safari Live is like a box of chocolates. Uh, you never know what you're going to get. Well, well, hopefully we get leopard. If not, we did have a fantastic morning. I mean, I can't wait to have a look at the footage of that black mamba sighting with Jamie. That sounded incredible. And an amazing, amazing time with those Ellies. guinea fowl. So very interesting, they paired off very late this year. So normally they pair off uh, a little bit earlier and they pair off to breed and they all nest on the ground and very well hidden nests. And then as the wet season ends and it goes into dry season, they start forming big flocks again. And Strange enough, for a, a bird like a guinea fowl, you would think the rainy season is where it's got the most food. Uh, quite often not. So they're very big fans of big of grass seeds, and in the dry, and the grass seeds start falling off. Big congregations of them feeding off those seeds. Kruler many times right in front of the camp here on the headwaters of the Mawati in these big jackalberries and trees around here so always worth a look and I said there's just so many elephants around that even if she has snuck past us here somewhere that, that the tracks might be obliterated by the vast amount of elephants it's always great having them around but sometimes they can make tra uh, tracking a little bit more challenging Jared would like to know, can a black mamba's fangs go deep enough uh, into the skin of an elephant to kill it? Well, Jared, I think it would definitely depend on where the, the black mamba bit the elephant. I think in certain places, maybe under the, in the armpits and around the groin, it's possible. But highly unlikely, a mamba would generally try and move as fast away from an elephant. Uh, it's far more likely that the elephant would kill a mamba by standing on it than the other way around. Uh, 
and strangely enough, I haven't seen it that often. I think I've seen it once or twice in, in, in the bush felt, uh, where we found snakes that have been killed by by elephants, by the trodden on. But strangely enough, while I was in the Central African rainforests in Gabon, in the Longa National Park, uh, we actually used to find probably twice or three times a week snakes that had been stood on by elephants. And so quite incredible that in that ecosystem it seemed to happen quite regularly. It could also be that we were on foot a lot more and we didn't have any vehicles. We walked everywhere, um, averaging well, probably about 30 kilometers a day uh, while we were surveying that concession in the rainforest. But we did find a lot of snakes that had been stood on by elephants. There was a, a little fly catcher, uh, one we haven't seen yet, uh, but hopefully we will be able to put it on camera for you at some point. Uh, it was a uh, dusky, an African dusky fly catcher. It's disappeared. Now, check again the western edge very carefully. Try to look between those elephant tracks. While we do that, uh, I think Jamie's checking around Philemon's cut line, Philemon's dip. So let's go get an update from her. We have just arrived at where Brent asked us to check around Philemon's cut line and quarantine. I'm doing some very careful checking if you see my head disappearing out over the side like this means it's because I don't want to miss the tracks. I did once. I went out on tracking team with Brent and I was sitting on the tracker seat and it was a cloudy day and I missed Karuna's tracks for a while and I didn't hear the end of it for a considerable period of time. So that is not an experience I'm keen to repeat. I'm going to be double and triple checking to make sure that I don't miss these tracks this time around. I got into serious trouble for that. One day, one day I'll catch him out on something. It'll happen eventually. Interesting that she moved from where she was to this particular area. That's what makes tracking Karuna such an intellectual exercise and such an experience, is the fact that she can be so, to me anyway, personally, I find her movements very unpredictable. As with all leopards, but particularly when tracking Karula, she tends to make 90 degree turns while she's walking. So Brent's been checking over to the western edge of quarantine. Lots of impala around here. Which are always good eyes and ears to follow in the bush. An interesting tracking exercise. interesting question as we track along for the wonderful Queen of Juma. Joseph would like to know what I think has, is the best thing that we've found here. I, I couldn't begin to answer. I mean that snake sighting we had today was absolutely incredible. One of the most special snake sightings I have ever had personally in my years in the bush and I'm sure Lots of people love the leopards and the individuals that we see. I 
always enjoy spending time at the hyena den. But those unique sightings, like the black mamba sighting we experienced, especially with the camera. Now I watch, I don't watch on the same screen size that you have, but I do have a monitor that shows me exactly what it is you are seeing through the camera lens. 